past few years have been challenging for businesses looking to fill their talent gaps. From high turnover to a worker-controlled market to increasing salary demands, the going has been tough for those trying to do this alone. It has meant businesses of all types have had to rethink the way they hire, their workplace structure, and how they approach talent acquisition in general. And while 2024 may not be as difficult for organizations as previous years have been, there are plenty of new trends to consider. Welcome to Yo's podcast, Back to Work. I'm your host, Joe McIntyre, and this is the second of our two-part series looking into how to develop an effective recruiting strategy in 2024. On our first episode, we welcomed Matt Rivera, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Yo and Yo's parent company, Day and Zimmerman. We talked about the new candidate journey, changes in employer branding, and the evolution of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. If you haven't listened to that yet, please check it out. Joining me today for part two is Tom Enright, Vice President of Recruiting Specialty Practices at Yale. Tom is an expert in the recruiting space who has spent years partnering with organizations, especially those in the technology space, to help them achieve their talent goals and prepare them for any challenges they may face. Welcome, Tom. Hey, Joe. Good to be here today. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you. So, of course, like I said, we covered a lot in our conversation with Matt, but as I'm sure you know, Tom, there's plenty to cover when it comes to the future of recruiting strategies. So let's talk a little bit first about the hybrid working model. It has and continues to change the way businesses operate. But what does it specifically mean for companies' talent acquisition efforts? So let's get into that a little bit. How do you anticipate sure. hybrid and remote work models influencing recruitment strategies in 24? Good question. That that topic's been going on for probably three plus years in our business. I remember doing an SIA panel discussion and I was asked, what's it look like for us going forward? And I honestly, I picked correctly. I didn't mean to. I It was a guesstimate based on what was happening and that hybrid would be you know, fantastic for a business. Uh, and I always look at our business internally as well as our clients. And hybrid and remote still has a lot of pluses for companies, us included internally. So I live in Charlotte and uh, I used to work and live in New York City. But throughout uh, the United States, both for us internally as well as with our clients, it's obvious they're struggling getting employees back to work, especially in the tech space, right? Because they can do their work at a high level, remote or hybrid. So I don't know when it's going to, you know, if it's going to ever go back to all in. I think it's going to be mostly hybrid and remote and companies, us included, you know, we have our work cut out for us to manage accordingly and make it inviting and productive for everybody in that environment. Do you think we're nearing an equilibrium where candidates or current employees are kind of meeting employers in the middle ground now? Uh, I think there was kind of this imbalance where maybe a lot of workers wanted to be fully remote or mostly remote when a lot of leaders wanted people to be mostly in person. But it seems to me like we're finding equilibrium. But what are you hearing? Yeah, I think it is leveling out right now. That's a good way to put it. And by the way, I'm old school. I still like going in. Uh, we have collaborate day one day a month. And when I go to the offices, man, it's fantastic. I'm, you know, I'm fully engaged. There's definitely, it's high energy on everybody's part and, and we're focused and you get a lot out of that. At the same time, I had to work with uh, hiring employees, hiring recruiters from entry level to senior uh, in a remote environment. And we were lucky to move to Zoom before everybody else did. And training them, onboarding them, uh, helping them understand the yo way, I thought would be a lot more difficult. It was a lot easier because of Zoom, honestly, and having meetings that way. I'm not saying there's not challenges. There's still a lot of challenges, but it's definitely leveling off right now in the industry. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of those challenges. I think some of the kinks, like you said, have been worked out, um, but we're on year four almost of this kind of working model that we're on. Um, what are the new challenges that we're going to have coming forward? And I mean, I think additionally also, what are those opportunities we talked about before in previous episodes, how companies can hire people essentially from all over now? Uh, it opens up that candidate pool, which in many ways is good, but I'm also in some ways, I'm, I'm sure that's a challenge too. It's hard to get good talent right now in the recruiting space. 
At the same time, there's a lot of recruiters out there, right? And there's a lot of technology people out there. And it's whether they're looking or whether they're passive. And how attractive your organization can be to the passive candidate, okay, I think is key, you know, um, and offering hybrid remote uh, in some capacity, you know, it's not an option. It, it's you have to do it at this point, okay? Uh, and you also have to have a plan once they're brought on from, from when it says first day to their first 30 days, first 90 days. You have to have a solid plan as a business owner, as a leader, as a manager uh, uh, when you're engaging with people remote and hybrid. If you don't have that, you're in trouble, okay? We know that. Um, and I, I've heard, I've seen people join, uh, and it could be just from the onboarding process and not having equipment, you know, to their home, you know, on their first day, their first week. So there is still a lot of challenges. You need that plan. If you're going to go uh, hybrid, if you, uh, if you haven't done it yet, if you're going to back off on your four days a week and you move into one day a week or two days a week, you can't just say it. You have to have a plan. Uh, employees want to know that beforehand. Uh, you know, they're they're bringing it up when they're speaking to recruiters uh, for the first time before they engage with the end customer. So there has to be a plan um, at the company level prior to engaging with candidates. Yeah, I mean, let's switching gears just a little bit, but staying on that same page, I think technology has enabled so much uh, with this remote, hybrid, in person model. But new technologies yeah. are always emerging in the recruiting space generally. So I think these yeah. tools not only help with talent acquisition, but can assist with candidate tracking, employee satisfaction, predictive staffing, yeah. a whole ton of stuff. Do you see any new tools or technologies emerging or becoming more the norm in 2024? Or you know, are there any technologies that businesses are currently using that are maybe in need of an update? A lot of it hasn't changed, okay? It's still how you engage, like how you're reaching out initially, whether it's uh, you know, texting is quite pop, uh, popular now. Is texting a new candidate or the first time you engage with them the best way to do it? I'm not sure. I don't think so. But people are successful doing it that way. Uh, in mailing, emailing, phone calls, um, automations and AI is all the buzzwords now. That helps. But you're not going to go away from the fundamentals of how you engage for the first time and follow up. That's really critical. You know, how uh, a staffing company, how a recruiter engages with candidates uh, is really, really important. And it's, it doesn't matter if you're a recruiter at a staffing agency or if at an end customer at a company. It's really important to build a relationship. Don't be transactional. It's not all about the metrics, both at staffing companies as well as uh, end customers. So if you're just looking to get that person involved in your process or being part of your process, uh, they pick that up really, really quickly. You know, So how you engage is really important from the first time uh, through the candidate life cycle, as well as post. A lot of candidates, even if it doesn't work out on that interview, they're still thinking of your company. So how you engage with them after that is really, really important. Uh, and automations and AI are definitely helping in that space. Yeah, I think we would be glossing over an important thing if we didn't mention automation and AI. But are there any dangers maybe in relying too much on technology, especially with automation AI, predictive models. Um, recruiting has always been such a human thing, uh, getting people yeah. jobs. Uh, it's, it's a very human yeah. element to it. So is there any danger with relying on too much? I think so. Um, and I know we're going to talk about uh, the multi-generational workforce at the latter part of this podcast. But if you're going to engage just with not having the human element in the beginning, a lot of danger with that. You know, So um, I really like after they're full, you're fully engaged with a candidate, they know you, you build a relationship uh, with that candidate using automations on the back end of the recruiter lifecycle, like just checking in, okay? Uh, an alert is, is really, really good, okay? And some examples, we've had a couple of people like any other organization leave us uh, that I built a good relationship with and I stayed in touch. And when there's a new opportunity reaching back out to those candidates, uh, is a better experience for both parties if you have done it the right way from the beginning uh, on how you engage and how you stay warm 
with that candidate. So, and like I said, a lot of recruiters, a lot of companies don't think like that. It's it's mostly transactional from the beginning. Uh, so we're going to have all these new tools coming out. They're in play right now. We use a lot of them. Um, I think when you have, you know, the multi-generational workforce, especially on the recruiting side, you know, I grew up all phone calls uh, and I had a tickler file and it was cumbersome. It's still solid, you know, and I think technology is supposed to help you with that. It's supposed to make it a better experience for a recruiter as well as a candidate. And sometimes it hurts us as well because they're not engaging the same way. And then the damage is done and recruiters don't have a great reputation to begin with, Joe. Uh, and you don't want to start out that relationship in the beginning by just being technology and not having that human element involved. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about how there's differences in generations, and we will, but people are still people, right? I mean, they still want to be yeah. cared for. They still want to be thought about as a priority. So despite what differences there may be in boomers, Gen X, Gen Z, millennials, whatever it is, people are still people, and they're still going to want that human interaction between someone who actually cares about them getting a job and is not just you know checking them off a list or thinking about them as a candidate, yeah. but an actual person. Yep. Yeah. Totally agree. I had an example uh, this morning and I didn't set this up. It was just organic, randomly. Somebody that I placed recruited back in the 90s in the dot com. Uh, and I sponsored him for his green card in the United States. Uh, and he ended up being a candidate as well as a manager. I had a very successful career. He reached out to me this morning and say, Hey, Tom, what's going on? I need to speak to you. OK, I didn't know if it was personally or professionally he needed to speak to me, but there was no technology back then besides the phone uh, uh, and how I engage with the candidate. So uh, I think if you keep that human touch part of the recruiting life cycle, whether it's a staffing company or an end customer, uh, it's going to go a long way. Yeah, um, I mean, it's crazy how how you're still doing this now for generations across many decades now. It's very impressive. Yeah. And I think we need to talk about how this new generation is different, right? I mean, it's known for its digital fluency, Gen Z's fast-paced expectations have a lot of unique demands, um, which is not unique to them, totally. Everybody has their own uh, things they're looking for. And in fact, we even talked about a few of them earlier this season on our podcast with J2 O'Donnell, uh, CEO and founder of Work at Daily. She told us that outdated methods simply won't cut it. We've often built these online practices where fill in all of your information and tell us what's different about you. And oh, yes, answer a bunch of questions and you might get a call from us. It doesn't work for Gen Z. I mean, they can't stay on the online application process right now. Uh, they would just as soon skip it entirely. And so it's amazing to me that companies are still out there pouring the amount of money they are pouring into online and job boards and places like that, trying to get volume applies. You're not going to see it from this generation. Like I said, they are job shoppers. Your money is much better spent going out and sharing with that audience where they live and that it's an expectation. New recruitment models are becoming essential. Uh, so with Gen Z entering the workforce, how can recruitment and staffing agencies adapt to meet the unique expectations or demands, whatever you want to say, um, of this generation and what needs to shift in the new year? Yeah. Uh, well, I, um, I mentioned having a plan, not only how you engage with them, but when they are onboarded and they're working with the organization, uh, first 90 days is critical anytime you have a new hire, but especially if it's uh, the generation we're talking about, and especially if it's a hybrid rem or remote work environment. So our group created uh, what we call the Yo Academy. When I think it was year two of the pandemic, there was a need for recruiters and we couldn't get them quick enough. And we were training college grads locally in Philadelphia. Uh, and our first class, I think, was 12. And they had to come in two days a week. OK, I wasn't sure if they were willing to do that, honestly. So I was pleasantly surprised they were. And it was the complete opposite uh, as far as engagement and feedback from them versus the millennial generation based on working remote or hybrid. And I remember one young lady, she said to us, 
I live with my parents and I'm working in my bedroom five days a week. I'd rather go into the office two or three days a week. So, um, and did I have a perfect plan or did we have a perfect plan? No, it was a hybrid environment and we were pleasantly surprised that was the feedback. And then once you have that, um, you know, that first part, then how they engage with others. We have them on Zooms and it's a group of eight. How they engage versus my generation engage is totally different. So you have to be able to um, look at your audience, look at all your employees in that environment and make sure that you're providing the right uh, type of learning uh, and career pathing and engaging, you know, before the meeting. You can't, you just can't roll up into the meeting and try to run a hybrid meeting and expect everybody's uh, singing or playing off the same sheet of music as our president likes to say. So you got to be thoughtful with that. They pick it up like this. You know, they really do. They pick it up very quick and they're going to make a quick decision that this might not be the right place for me. You know, whether they have a job lined up or not, uh, that's this generation. And I get it. Uh, and and I think it's really important to have multi generations working in your workforce. There's so many pluses for it. Uh, but if it's not thought about uh, and set up and managed the right way, it, there could be a lot of struggles as well. I think that's so, so important to talk about because in many ways, it can feel intimidating that do I need to shift the way I recruit? Do I need to shift the way I hire just for this yeah. one generation? But I'm guessing that's not really the case. There is unique, you know, intricacies of every generation. Um, but just maybe for our listeners, can you can you know ease some of those concerns that they don't need to shift their entire recruitment model just for this one generation? Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you have to be thoughtful about who you're hiring, just like no matter who you're hiring, what age they are, you know, what uh, skill set they are, we're operating, we're working in a totally different environment now, especially if it's all remote or if it's hybrid, right? Um, and uh, you're not shifting all your priorities, but you have to be aware of it and conscious of who you're hiring and come up with a plan or be thoughtful about um, you know, how they're going to engage with others on a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or in person, you know, just like if if, if everybody was coming into the office. Uh, and I think what's really important is what they're learning from their peers and from their managers in a remote hybrid environment versus in person is totally different. And it's a different way of thinking. So us as leaders, us, uh, uh, anyone in a hiring capacity has to think about that. So it's not difficult uh, and it's not a major shift, uh, but we have to be thoughtful about it before we bring them on. Let's shift gears for maybe a, a final couple of questions here, Tom. I think sure. we've, to knock on wood, uh, re- kind of survived potential economic downturn pretty well. It seems like yep. we're kind of away from the fears of a recession or whatever that may have been. But the potential is still looming. There's still concerns from economists to everybody in between. And it does affect demand for talent and it affects how people fill those gaps. So is there any change or how should companies maybe plan for the possibility of a recession and its impact on the workforce in 24? Is there anything they can or even should do or they should just kind of see where things go? I've had the privilege of working in the dot-com environment. I experienced 9-11 because our office was diagonally across the street from the towers that day. Uh, we had a market correction in uh, 2008 to 2010 with the mortgage collapse. Uh, and then I've been thinking about, you know, right before COVID, COVID and post-COVID, you know. So I don't think there, I don't think you can prepare for it. You know, it's not a major shift. You should always be engaging with your workforce and thinking about what type of candidates are out there. And usually it's not forever if there is a, a recession or what we're calling right now a soft landing. I don't know when it's going to turn around. I talk about it constantly with my team right now. I talk about it with hiring managers, with candidates. Um, as a recruiting organization, um, us building a relationship with candidates and understanding what's happening in the marketplace based on a skill set, job title in our specific region, I think that's so valuable to companies. So we see it, uh, you know, on the front line working with our candidates. And what we like to do is share it with our hiring managers. They solicit it a lot of times, the information as well. 
Uh, so partner, partnering with a good staffing agency, a good company that provides good quality candidates has been a, around a long time, has a solid management team that has tenure. That's really, really important, both ex work, working with your partners as well as internally. Um, and I, I think that's the, you know, you can't make a major shift uh, as far as do I do something different, how I engage and recruit. Uh, it's definitely going to turn around. You got to be prepared to uh, when it does turn around, how we're bringing people on, how are we going to brand ourselves? You know, people aren't coming back to the office like they expected in big cities. What if it changes even more and instead of 40% in office, they're 20%? What are we going to do? How are we going to attract those types of people? So I think you got to think about what's going to happen in the future and not worry about it so much as far as uh, the economy and, and you know, hiring people and, and the marketplace. Yeah, that probably also speaks to the importance of obviously engaging with recruiting firms, but many companies aren't hiring every single day. They're not hiring yeah. the same kind of people or different kind of people every single day. So a recruiting firm like Yo or whomever it is yeah. uh, would know because we're talking to people every single day across industries, yeah. across specialty yeah. practices. So we know where those trends are going. And it just, mm -hmm. it, it talks about that need to work with a, a firm that really gets it, really gets it in specific mm -hmm. industries in which you're willing to hire or looking to hire because we have that expertise and we know kind of where those sands are shifting uh, as, you know, uh, and they can shift in a matter of months, weeks, uh, and days probably sometimes. I uh, uh, totally agree. Um, and what we do, and I really do say this to end customers and managers I know for a long time or someone who's engaged with us for the first time, if you're a company and you're trying to figure out what you're recruiting uh, plan is for 2024, speaking to candidates, even when you don't have a job, is critical. Is critical, right? It just, you know, just like uh, uh, we teach our recruiters, engage with candidates, build a relationship, don't be transactional, don't lead with a job, uh, because you want to be working with them for their career instead of just one job and moving on. And I think end customers, clients have to do the same exact thing. They have big you know, they have a big TA staff, a, a large amount of recruiters there. They're, they're engaged just because there's not a job right now doesn't mean they shouldn't be acting exactly like staffing companies and engaging with candidates and talking to them about their company and what's going on. So it's totally fine to talk to a candidate without having a job. It, it might not work out right now, but in four months, six months, when you call back up or more importantly, when they call you back up, a Mr. or Mrs. Recruiter or a TA and say, hey, I was really impressed by my conversation with you when it was bad back in November. Uh, I'm about to start looking. I was wondering if you'd be interested in some of my skill set now. That's a fantastic call. And I think if they more companies did that, I know staffing companies do that, I think it would be it would it really help them when times are tough and when it turns around as quick with their competitors. Yeah, do you find people are more or less receptive to those less transactional conversations? Are candidates more open to it, less open to it than they were, or it's pretty much the same as it always has been? It's the same. I, I think it's worse now as far as the reputation of recruiters based on all the tools we talked about earlier, like the le uh, less phone calls and just bombarding them or what we call it, uh, blasting or spamming them on in-mails and emails. Um, I, I think it's probably worse uh, if or or the same. And I think there's an opportunity for recruiters, for staffing companies, for TA teams, for end clients to change the narrative by being, you know, you know, having having a human conversation, having that human touch. Make sure it doesn't go away, because especially in our space, the high end. Uh, technology person that we're working with, you can't engage like that. They won't work with you, you know? So uh, you won't get that phone call or that text that I got this morning from somebody I work with in 97, you know? And he, he asked me where I was going on vacation. I asked about his kids, you know? I know him since his kids are in his 20s now, you know? So uh, that doesn't happen when uh, an, uh, an automation is happening from your database, you know? So I think end customers have to be, have to realize that's part of their business plan in 2024 and moving forward. Yeah. Tom, final question here. Maybe you can make, it doesn't need to be a bold prediction, but a prediction for the new year that maybe some people haven't been talking about enough or haven't been thinking about, or you've been thinking about that people aren't uh, really just discussing with you. What is your bold prediction for 24 in the recruiting space? 
Well, I said this during the height of the frenzy for hiring during COVID. It's a good time to be a recruiter. Uh, so I think, that, you know, I, that's my bold prediction. It's still a great time to be a recruiter. So this has happened before um, in, in our economy and staffing with end customers looking for uh, candidates. Uh, it's going to change. It's going to shift. We have to be ready when it changes. Uh, and it's going to be a good time to be a recruiter again in 2024. So I think that's my bold prediction. I don't think a lot of people are saying that right now, but I firmly believe it. Love that. Tom, yeah. thanks so much for joining us uh, on Back to Work. If our listeners want to get in touch with you, questions about recruiting, getting into it, getting a job, um, they're looking for more information, how should they get in touch with you? Best way to get a hold of me or connect is on LinkedIn. And I'll get back to everyone pretty quickly. Awesome. And we'll link to that, uh, link to your profile in our episode description for sure. I appreciate the time. It was, it was fun. Oh, it was Thanks, great Jeff. Time. To our listeners uh, who want to hear previous episodes or future episodes of this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen in. For Back to Work, I'm Joe McIntyre. Thanks for listening.